Hello everyone, so welcome back. This is Microeconomics. So we are um, actually um, at the stage where we already know um, quite a few um, uh, in-depth study of the standard supply and demand models. So um, starting this weekend on, we are going to focus on um, the firm's um, study and we are trying to define different um, uh, behaviors of the firms. Um, especially when we placing a firms in a different market structure. Well, before we get to that, we are going to start um, from this chapter here to talk about um, the cost and the production behavior of the firms. So in this chapter, we are going to talk about um, the um, concept of uh, firms behavior and how uh, firms uh, will try to achieve their goals um, by um, taking certain actions um, uh, or, or making certain decisions um, in the productions. So first of all, we are going to define uh, different types of uh, uh, concepts of in terms of cost and profits. Um, so we will talk about what is uh, the difference between implicit cost and uh, explicit cost uh, in the productions. And also uh, we would like to um, define what we mean by the accounting profits of the firms and economic profits. And later, we are going to break down the chapter into uh, two other sections. So one is the um, one that we are going to focus on uh, the short run productions of the firm. And then later, we're going to um, discuss the long run productions of the firms. So before anything, um, just want to um, kind of briefly go over uh, what um, it's a firm objective uh, in our economy. So firms usually define in the markets where they are the one who supply the products and produce the products. Um, of course, um, firm uh, will not be supplying the products in the market without any um, goal to achieve. Um, and also very uh, intuitively, um, any firm or businesses in the world, they have only one objective, which is maximizing their profits. So in order to maximize profits, um, firms will have to make the, uh, the following decisions um, during the production periods. So for instance, um, number one, they have to first find out what kind of goods or what kind of service they would like to produce in order to make profits. And number two, um, they would like to um, identify the quantity of the outputs they should produce in order to maximize the profits. And number three, they would like to know how they should produce the goods and services. And number four, what kind of inputs they should employ in the productions in order to make the final goods and services to sell for profits. So those are the everyday decisions of the firm. So again, the goal for the firm has only one, which is maximizing the profits. So whatever they are trying to decide on, um, it's only have one goal is to get the maximum amounts of profits out of the business. Well, before we moving further, um, just want to uh, very quickly um, went over the concept of entrepreneurships. Um, so as everyone knows, um, businesses are basically um, um, just a terms that we use to describe the behavior of a productions. However, the one who actually um, um, started the business or to uh, manage the business is the one who uh, um, who actually uh, began uh, with the business idea and put it um, in practice. So those are the people we call them the entrepreneurs. So the entrepreneurs are basically people who provide goods and services uh, when they are taking the risks and in the hopes of getting uh, profits from the markets. There are different types of entrepreneurships. Uh, for instance, when a business is owned by one single uh, owner, um, in this case, uh, we call this business a sole proprietor. And if the business actually involved with several owners um, and they are the one who making the decision, decisions together for the firm, uh, we call this types of business um, the partnerships. And the most uh, modern or the most um, uh, inferential uh, types of uh, business ownerships, it's what we call the corporations. So corporation, it's basically um, defining a business that can be uh, publicly owned uh, by anyone. So whoever interested into the business, they can um, at any time to uh, join the business as part of the owner. So most of the public listing company in the modern days are basically the corporations uh, types of business where the 
uh, company can be easily uh, transformed from one person to another person as long as um, there is a uh, buyer um, out there who are interested to invest into uh, that particular business. So those are the basic types of entrepreneurships that we have seen um, in the modern days. But again, our ultimate goal is to discuss about how um, the business owner will make the decisions um, and how they are going to um, look for the profit maximizing decisions um, in uh, their own industries. So when we talk about profits, there are two sides of the um, businesses actually um, uh, form these profits for, uh, for the firms. So we should always uh, keep in mind there is always a revenue side and a cost side of the business. So the profits, it's basically calculated by using the total revenues that the firm earns by selling the products, subtract the total cost for running the productions to produce the final goods and services in the markets. And that is always the case. So when we saying that the business is trying to maximize the profits, we are basically referred to the profits in this equation here, but not just the revenue nor minimizing the cost. So we are basically trying to put two things together to form this one unique identity called profits. So any firm would like to um, uh, have uh, the profit maximized, they of course have the following goal. Of course, they want to, um, to get the maximum uh, values of revenue as possible. And at the same time, they want to um, minimize the cost as low as possible in order to uh, have this um, uh, gap between the two value. And uh, in most cases, we actually use the term marginal profits um, to describe the firm's behavior um, whenever they're making a decisions um, to do uh, some extra uh, activities. So again, well, for people who are not very familiar with the concept of revenues, um, I'm giving you an example here. So for instance, if we have, let's say, one, two, three, four, five, five pizza shops here, and we are listing out the quantity of the pizza, so by each shop, shops, and also the price that they sell in the market. If we are trying to calculate the revenue here, let's say for Pizza High. Well, Pizza High actually sold 30 units of pizza in the market, and each pizza they charge $18. And at the end, the total revenues for Pizza High to earn is $540. So again, this $540 is not subtracting the cost yet. So it's not the profits for Pizza High, but it's just the revenue. And one thing worth to note, it's not always the case where the firm charging a higher price will get a higher revenue. And in this case, you can actually see that, well, when Pizza High actually charging $18, which is the highest in the market, it's not necessary that they will get the highest revenue because the total revenue is made up by two unique quantity here, which is the quantity of the pizza sold and also the price of the pizza. So one uh, variable price is not going to make up the revenue of the firms. So it has to be uh, both the quantity and the price to make up the revenues. Well, in this uh, um, study of the profits, we also want to identify what we mean by explicit cost and implicit cost. This is especially important in the context of economics. The reason is because when we talk about profits, most of the time we actually include both implicit cost and explicit cost for running a business. However, when you are trying to um, study accountants, um, accountant is basically the types of uh, um, uh, uh, um, calculations that we don't include the implicit cost uh, of the firm's uh, business. So let's take a look at this uh, example here. So for instance, let's say we have a friend, his name is Eric, so he is currently working as an accountant and earning a $75,000 a year annual, annual income from his jobs. One day he quits his job and start a tapioca milk tea, tea, uh, tea store. In the first year, he sold 50,000 cups of tapioca milk tea at the price of $5 per cup. And he break down the dollar amount that he spent for this business at the following tables. So as you can see here, 
So Eric actually quit his jobs to start this new business. And this new business actually earned uh, uh, running in the following format. So Eric uh, bought some cups, which uh, in that year, he spent a total of $5,000 just for the cups. Rent that he pays, $50,000. Ingredients, $10,000. Electricity, $5,000. And the total sum of the cost in this productions for the whole year, it's add up to be $70,000. So, he sold 50,000 cups of tapioca meat tea and at a price of $5 each cup. So that means we can now calculate the revenues of, uh, for Eric. So Eric will have a total revenue of 50,000 cups of tapioca times $5 uh, per cup, which is uh, $250,000. However, when we look at the cost part, we are going to define what we mean by the implicit cost and explicit cost here. Explicit cost basically define the cost for running a production for uh, the business. And in this case, particularly, Eric is paying $70,000 to pay for the productions. However, the implicit cost for Eric to pay in this business, it's basically the opportunity cost that he uh, suffers for running this business. And how we measure it, it's basically assuming that if Eric is not running this business, but he is still working as an accountant for that particular year, well, his wages is going to be $75,000. So the opportunity cost for running a business in this particular year will be the salary that Eric gives up, gives up in that one year, which is $75,000. So in a regular case, um, most of the time, businesses will not report the implicit cost when they calculating the um, uh, profits um, in a particular financial year because implicit cost is not something that can be quantified easily and it cannot be proved. So the only thing that will be reported by the businesses usually is just the explicit cost for running the business. However, you know that Eric is not doing uh, as well as before if we don't actually include the implicit cost. There is no way for us to compare. As long as the implicit cost is out of the equations, we cannot tell whether Eric is doing better or not. Well, why we need an implicit cost? Why is implicit cost important in economics? If we look at the profits calculations here, we can now take a look of how accounting profit is being calculated. So the accounting profits calculated in the business, it's basically using the total revenue minus the total cost, which is the implicit cost of the business only. However, when we talk about the economic profits, the economic profits actually is calculated by using the total revenue minus the total cost again, but this time the total cost is made up by both the explicit cost and implicit cost. So both the cost of productions and the cost uh, the opportunity cost of running the business. So if we put those two together, and obviously we know now Eric, when he is calculating his accounting profits, he might think that he is getting $180,000 of profits in that particular year for running a tapioca multi store. However, if we want to know how well Eric actually doing comparing to the previous year when he was an accountant, how much more he is getting from his life. The economic profits calculation will allow him to look at this number here, which is $105,000. And this is basically how much better Eric is doing better as he was an accountant. So Eric is not getting a total of $180,000 more as comparing to the previous year because the fact that, well, he actually gave up his jobs which is the $75,000 of incomes. In a very easy case, you can actually put this economic profits into uh, equations like this one right here. When we have a firm that's earning, let's say eight coins of total revenues, and the firms will need to pay four coins for the productions. This is the part we call this explicit cost in the business. And another four coins are basically spent, or well, in this case, no one spent it because, well, this implicit cost cannot be captured by a regular calculations. 
However, if we know in our life, when we're running a business, we have to always give up four coins to start this business. Well, we have to always consider how much we're giving up here. So the general idea is if we actually have a case like this one here, we have a total revenue of $8 and the explicit cost is $4 and the implicit cost is $4. Well, the sum of the total economic profits will be $0. Well, we would like to ask the case, just like Eric, is this person earning zero economic profits actually doing very, very bad? And indeed, earning a zero economic profit is not bad at all in economic study. The reason is because earning a zero economic profit is just as well as we are doing other things in our life. And also we are giving a name here, we call the zero economic profits as the normal profits in the business. So in this case, even Eric, if he is earning a zero economic profits, what it means is, well, Eric can either do his accounting jobs and earn that $75,000 of salary in that year, or maybe he can run a business and still getting a $75,000 of accounting profits. But now we have a very good concept about um, how we calculate profits for the firm and the economic profit is what we're going to use uh, for the rest of the um, study in uh, this class. So you have to keep in mind when we talk about the firm's profits in the later chapters, we always refer to the economic profits. And now we would like to actually uh, think a little bit more about um, how firms running the productions before we get into the costs uh, for running the productions. <clears throat> so when we talk about the productions of the firm, we're basically thinking about how firms is making a transformations of the resources or production inputs and turn it into a goods or services that we usually buy in a market. So most, in most cases, you can think about production. It's basically just like a black box. You put something in there and finally something get out so that the firm can use it to sell for profits. Well, in general, we know how the outputs or the goods and services looks like, but we do want to uh, define a little bit further about this inputs. So what are the types of inputs that the firm will need to put into this back blocks to produce the final goods and services? Well, the first thing that we are going to define here is called a fixed input. So the fixed inputs are basically uh, the inputs, the production inputs where the firms cannot make changes. It's fixed. It's basically um, just um, uh, not be able to vary uh, within uh, certain periods of time. So for instance, if you think about like a apple juice productions um, in the United States, um, let's say the company actually uh, just signed a rent on a production plan for five years. So within this five years, uh, the production plans, basically it's what we call the fixed inputs for the firm. Well, even though within the five years, the firm will have this fixed capacity to produce apple juice. However, between the times, there are something that can be varied. And in this case, we define another types of inputs, which is the variable inputs. So the variable inputs are basically the ones that can be changed and can be varied during the production periods. And in this particular case, well, you can think about the apple juice production firm, maybe when he is or this company is trying to produce 100 bottle of apple juice, they will need to put 100 apples into the machines and produce it. However, if the firm want to produce, let's say 5,000 apple juice, well, they will need to put 5,000 apples into the productions. So the total quantity of apples in this case can be changed depends on what is the quantity of outputs that the firm want to produce. So in this case, well, you can now kind of like getting a concept and trying to define what types of inputs that the firm will need to put into the, produ to the productions. So again, variable inputs are the one that can be changed within a production period. Fixed inputs is the one that is not going to change and it will not be varied uh, regardless what is the production outputs uh, that the firm want to produce. Well, 
why are we defining two types of production inputs? Because, well, this uh, two production inputs actually help us to define the production periods of the firms. And we are going to define two different production periods here. One is called the long run production periods and the other one called the short runs. So the long run and the short run productions, it's basically a concept that describes a specific period of firms uh, production process. The long run production periods, it's when all the production inputs in the production, it's basically defined as a variable input. So everything can be vary during the long run productions. Well, if you think about the previous example, well, even the size of the plans can also be changed by the firm in the long run because, well, after the five years of contracts, now the firm can actually plan for the longer term. If they are doing very, very good, they want to expand, they can move to a bigger capacity of production plans. If the firm think that they are not doing so well, they want to strain down, they can also move to a smaller size or smaller scales of production plans. In the short runs, well, this is the period of time where the firm will have to face at least one production input that it's fixed. So something that cannot be changed easily in that particular period. So in the previous example, well, within the five uh, year periods, um, obviously, um, the firm is facing this one fixed production input, which is the size of the firms or the capacity of the productions. And in this case, even though all the other things like laborers, apples, machines, equipments, all these things can be changed during the short runs, but as long as the firm is facing this one production input that cannot be easily changed, we're basically referring to the short run production periods. So the rule of thumbs, in the long runs, there is no fixed inputs in the productions. Everything in the production, it's basically the variable inputs, which can be varied and adjust. In the short run productions periods, a firm cannot make change on certain inputs, which means at least one or some of these inputs are fixed. So now we have a very good understanding about how we define the production periods of the firms. Well, in the next videos, we would like to investigate how the firm will determine um, the productions uh, uh, related to its costs. So, um, Please um, read the chapter's uh, readings and uh, be prepared for the next videos. I'll see you next time.